To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit GoStudyHall.com or click the link in the description. It's easy to look at things like the technology that simplifies our lives and the institutions that keep us safe and compare those things to the more difficult ways of living in the past. But it's just as easy to look at things like climate change and hostile political environments to realize that maybe the relationship between history and progress is complicated. Historically, change can be good or bad to varying degrees and depending on who you are. And it often comes with a tangible human cost. So as the Americas and Afro-Eurasia collide, let's look at what happens as exploration, trade, and diplomacy bring the world a little closer together through the silver trade, but at a serious cost. My name is Rob Fuller, and this is Study Hall, Modern World History. We've said it before in this course, and we'll say it again. People love stuff. And the want for stuff, either luxury or basic needs, is a big driver of change throughout human history. And when it comes to the early 16th century, there are plenty of examples we could point to, but the silver trade really stands out as a sign of the global connection on the horizon, since it's one of the first examples of a truly global trading system. The silver trade was a vast trading network that reached from Spain to South America and then on to Asia, really all over the world. And surprisingly, it was kickstarted by a simple change in economic policy in China. Silver has been used to coin money for literally thousands of years. Silver coins date back to ancient Greece and continued to be used by the Roman Empire after Greece's decline. Silver was rare in China, but it spread through trade along the Silk Road. Paper money, you know, cash, has been printed in China since the 12th century and was used alongside bronze coins. But every dynasty that printed its own paper money watched in horror as that money became worthless over time. They didn't hold back on printing more money, though. And as they printed more cash, they ended up devaluing their own currency. They just didn't have a great grasp on inflation, which is when the value of a currency falls. Which can happen for a variety of reasons, like artificially increasing the supply, as in 12th century China's case. I mean, there's nothing wrong with printing your own money, right? I've been printing Rob Bucks for years. Bronze coins were slightly better than paper money, since metal holds inherent value. Bronze was used for blacksmithing, unlike paper money, which served no real purpose outside of buying things. But bronze coins were also pretty easy to counterfeit, so they're not much better. During the Ming Dynasty in the 15th century, because of the rapid inflation, some rural farmers and city workers reverted back to a barter economy, meaning they traded goods directly instead of exchanging cash for them. Even government officials would often take as much as half of their pay in grains like rice and the rest would be paid in goods like silk, cotton, and pepper. Clearly, money was a problem. So around the 1570s, the Ming made two major tax reforms, under the single whip tax system, a new law which changed the way China collected taxes. The first reform, simplifying the tax code, didn't have a major global impact. But the second? Well, that's a very different story. For the second reform, all taxes had to be paid in silver, which would turn out to be a big deal. Silver was more valuable and held its value better than paper or bronze because there was a limited supply. But that limited supply meant many people, especially rural farmers, just didn't have access to it. So how do you pay your taxes in silver if you don't have silver? Well, you don't. The Ming Dynasty only produced four to six tons of silver a year, which was nowhere near what they needed. So they had to import silver to prop up this new tax system, and a lot of it. They were able to import quite a bit of silver from Japan, which helped, but still wasn't enough. This sudden change meant the demand for silver shot up in China, which would have a profound impact on global trade. That demand attracted trade partners willing to meet that demand, which brings us to Spain and its colonies. While all this economic change was happening in China around the turn of the 16th century, Spain was busy turning from a country on the edge of Europe into an empire that spanned the globe. Conquistadors like Pizarro and Cortes were kind of like multi-class players in D&D. They were both explorers and military leaders mixed into a single role that traveled to places Europeans had never seen before, searching for ways to enrich their countries. Conquistadors were deeply interested in the wealth they believed the Americas held, and, at first, that wealth came in the form of precious metals like gold and silver. In 1534, Pizarro conquered Cuzco, the capital of the Inca Empire in South America. And nearly a decade later, the search for precious metals led to the discovery of silver in the mountains of modern-day Bolivia. The Spanish named the silver mines Cerro Rico, the Rich Mountain, 
and they built the city of Potosi there to facilitate mining. But building a city was an undertaking. They had to drain marshlands, set up housing for workers, build mills to grind silver ore, and create five man-made lakes just to power the mills. Just over 50 years later, Potosi had grown into a city of 160,000 people, which, for comparison, was about the same size as Paris at the time. The main difference between those cities is that Potosi was inhabited largely by indigenous Americans who had been enslaved by the Spanish and forced to work. The silver then traveled from Potosi to Seville, the official port in Spain where commodities from the Americas were assessed. A portion of the silver remained in Europe, but the rest was headed for Asia. This trip was both long and dangerous. The Spanish ships sailed across the Atlantic, around Africa, and across the Indian Ocean, sometimes stopping in Mughal India to sell silver before finally reaching Ming China. And many ports along the way were controlled by their rivals, uh, the Portuguese or the Dutch Netherlands. In return, China sold the Spanish porcelain, silk, perfumes, and spices, while India traded linen and spices. All in all, it was a trip worth the dangers, but there still had to be a better way to transport silver from the Americas to Asia. Then Spain found that path, straight across the Pacific Ocean to the Philippines. Spain began trying to conquer the Philippines as soon as Magellan first traveled there in 1521. That didn't go so well for Magellan, since he died in the process, but by 1565, Spanish forces set up their first permanent settlement. And just six years later, they established the city of Manila, which would become their central trading hub in Asia. And the timing could have hardly been better for Spain. The year Manila was founded, 1571, was incredibly close to when China established their single whip tax policy, thereby increasing the demand for silver. In less than 100 years, Manila had grown to a population of around 42,000 people. And more than half of those residents were Chinese or Spanish merchants, outnumbering the Filipino population of the city. So two new cities, Potosi and Manila, rose solely to support the silver trade that was booming around the world. And the distances we're talking about were incredible. From Spain to South America to the Philippines to China, all to meet China's new demand for silver. That trade made a lot of people rich and connected disparate parts of the world in a new way, which sounds great. But at the same time, it was built on the back of exploitation and murder. From the enslaved people of Potosi to the Filipinos who died defending their land from the Spanish. While the construction of two major cities and a global trade network are huge feats, there is a human cost that is important to understanding these changes. In South America, the city of Potosi was divided into districts based on a racial hierarchy. And those Andean workers had been forced into service through a system known as the Mita system. By the 1560s, the Spanish had set up the Viceroyalty of Peru, which ruled all of Spanish South America, and the leader or Viceroy of Peru, Francisco de Toledo, based his Mita system on the Inca labor tax. The thing is, though, that's not entirely true. In the Incan Mita system, the Incan Empire invested heavily in taking care of its own people. While workers would be forced to farm, serve in the military, build stone roads, or complete other tasks for the Incan Empire, the empire in turn fed and protected the poor, sick, elderly, and widowed, using a system of storehouses to supply those in need. So historians generally agree that this system used by the Incas was a tax and not a form of enslavement. Which may sound weird, but imagine instead of paying money to the IRS, the Inca people worked for the government. And in exchange, the government provided them with public services. By comparison, the Mita system under the Spanish was a system of slavery. Enslaved Andean laborers worked in the mines, where dangerous working conditions, malnutrition, and overwork led to the deaths of thousands. And living conditions were equally treacherous. In 1624, the San Salvador Dam broke killing hundreds and washing away most of the housing in the Andean districts. In the native Quechua tongue, Potosi was referred to as the mountain that eats men. So for many Andeans, the silver trade was devastating, while for the Spanish, it helped to turn them into one of the most powerful empires in 16th century Europe. Spain then used that money to wage wars in the Netherlands, England, and France, all of which, unfortunately for Spain, ended in failure. On the other hand, Spain's economy came crashing down in the early 17th century, as the cost of multiple wars and poor leadership pushed Spain deep into debt. Inflation was a particularly pernicious problem here because, once again, they didn't have the best grasp on economics. Meanwhile, in the Americas, Potosi would become a symbol of inequality and the mistreatment of the Andean people. 
leading to the Tupac Amaru Rebellion in 1780 and the later Wars of Independence that helped free South America from Spanish rule. Globally, the silver trade provided a way for European merchants to enter and expand their role in the global market. There were already large networks of trade across both land, like the Silk Road, and sea, like the Indian Ocean. But Europeans had previously lacked the luxury goods or natural resources necessary to truly become a central trading partner. Silver helped shift Europe's role from an outsider to a participant, a role that would only continue to expand. But the true price of economic expansion is messy. We all want nice things, but those things can be expensive. And as we can see with the silver trade in Potosi, the way these things become affordable is often through the gross exploitation of labor. That method of economic expansion wasn't new to the world. But over the next few centuries, we'll see it rise more and more and more. If you're enjoying Study Hall Modern World History and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, visit GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.